Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to our panel session on uh, rethinking openness in the context of artificial intelligence. Uh, my name is Frey van der Boom. I'm a, a PhD candidate at Bournemouth University, uh, and I'm looking at uh, some of these aspects. Um, I'll be the moderator of the, uh, the panel today, uh, and we have uh, four amazing speakers that will enlighten you about some of the challenges. Um, I'll introduce them in a minute. I'll just uh, briefly uh, uh, state what our panel is going to be about. So, as you probably know, uh, the development of algorithms requires access to large amounts of data. Um, open data initiatives address the need for access to data to help, of course, advance the development and adoption of beneficial AI in society. So to address the challenges posed by and for AI access to data, we may need to redefine what openness means, which is the main theme of the panel presentations. Um, so we know that the PSI directive has already helped us a lot with making data held by public sectors open uh, for the use and training of AI systems, um, which unfortunately at the moment is not yet the case for privately held data. Uh, specifically human created works protected by copyright or neighboring rights, which is one of the topics that we will be talking about as well. Uh, moreover, we know that private companies uh, who benefit from access to open data are often in a position to also create proprietary or quasi-proprietary entitlements around the outcomes of data processing. And in that sense, they will be turning open access into de facto exclusive rights in reverse. So some of the questions we are eager to share and discuss with you afterwards in the panel discussion are insights into the dangers of unregulated use of AI and whether the current EU policy and regulatory framework is fit for purpose to respond to the concerns. So what are these concerns that um, you probably also know, but we'll discuss that a little bit more uh, in the panel presentations, uh, the impact of AI on privacy and data protection. So in addition to the GDPR, to balance between the free flow of data and personal data protection, uh, the panel will also look specifically at the role of the new copyright directive and um, the Digital Rights Service Act. Um, afterwards, we look very much forward to hearing from you, so please do join the discussion and share your insights and your questions, which uh, I will address um, after the, uh, the speakers have done their presentation. Um, so let's begin. Um, our first speaker is uh, Brigitte Vezina, who is the Director of Policy at Creative Commons, and she is uh, driving its copyright policy and advocacy activities there. Uh, before joining Creative Commons, she worked for a decade as a legal officer at WIPO and then she ran her own consultancy, uh, advising on U Europeana, Spark Europe uh, and others on copyright matters. So she's a perfect um, uh, uh, member to the panel to, uh, to discuss these kind of things. Um, she's also a fellow at the Canadian Think Tank Center for International Governance and Information. Uh, uh, and innovation. I'm sorry, I uh, I said that wrong. So um, please, Brigitte, whenever you're ready, uh, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Breda, for the introduction. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here and share a few insights on Creative Commons work relating to artificial intelligence, copyright, and openly licensed content. Uh, next, please. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to start with uh, trying to circumscribe what the notion mm -hmm. of AI really is. Um, so simply put, AI, according to us, is um, intelligence or a simulation of intelligence, which is complete. I can hear someone speaking. Sorry. Yeah, Javier, I think it's you. So artificial intelligence is uh, intelligence or a simulation of intelligence, which is uh, completely implemented via an automated machine, such as a digital computer. Um, I want to note, however, that there is no clear globally agreed definition of artificial intelligence. And since it is evolving rapidly, it is raising complex issues that deserve global attention. However, before we can address those issues, I think AI needs to be 
properly understood and defined before any copyright implications can be addressed. Next, please. So to summarize, uh, I'd like to make three points and I'll try to be brief in making those. First is that uh, we believe that there should be no copyright protection on AI outputs. The second point I'll go uh, to is that broad copyright exceptions and limitations should be available for AI inputs when those uh, uses are in the public interest. And finally, that a coordinated approach is needed to consider not only copyright law aspects, but also privacy, ethics, et cetera. Next, please. So point number one, as I said, so no copyright protection for AI outputs. Uh, the argument goes that uh, copyright is designed to encourage human creativity, which is defined as uh, authorship and originality, uh, by providing economic incentives and rewards uh, in, in return for enabling public access to and use of creations. Next. Next, please. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the first uh, aspect of um, uh, creativity is then uh, the notion of authorship. And for a work to be protected by copyright, there needs to be creative involvement on the part of an author, quote unquote. Uh, the Berne Convention, which is the main instrument uh, on copyright, states that protection shall operate for the benefit of the author, but it doesn't define what an author is. Uh, under EU law, there is no definition of author, but the case law has established that only human creations are protected. Um, under a civil law tradition, as AI systems arguably do not have a personality that they could imprint on what they produce, uh, authorship is beyond limits for AI. Next, please. In the United States, the 2016 case of the monkey selfie established that there could be no copyright in pictures taken by a monkey because the picture was taken without any human intervention, which became the test for authorship. Um, in many common law countries, including uh, the UK, Ireland, New Zealand, um, there, the law grants copyright-like protection to computer-generated works. However, there's a nuance there that the law assumes that there is some form of creative intervention by a human. Um, outputs that are clearly coming out from a purely mechanical process with no direct human creative involvement should then not constitute works protected by copyright. Next, please. Moving to the orig originality requirement, uh, under common law, there's a minimal level of creativity that is arguably very low uh, of intellectual labor and independent creation. Originality refers to the author as being the origin of the work. Under EU law, the work is original if it reflects the author's own intellectual creation. So if it's, if it's the expression of the author's personal touch, and the result of free and creative choices. Therefore, originality is a reflection of the intellectual creative choices made by the author. And then the work needs to be the proximate, that is to say the direct causal result of human action. Since AI cannot make free and creative choices on its own, creativity as a concept is not applicable to machines. Uh, so in conclusion, when we look at um, authorship and creativity, we recognize that these, these are at odds with non-human, quote-unquote, creativity. Um, the creative, quote-unquote, choices that are made by AI are not attributable to any causal link between a human and the output. Uh, it's not a human that defines the final form of expression of the result. Um, the human involvement uh, is solely mechanical or not authorial or creative. Uh, and the randomness uh, of the elements that are incorporated in AI program are actually what gives the illusion of creativity. Um, the closer one gets to a semblance of a creative work created by a human, the higher the similarity and therefore the lower the originality. So what we see created by uh, AI is not necessarily 
creative, the way we understand it for humans, is just the randomness that creates this illusion of, cre of creativity. Um, and then moving aside those more theoretical questions about uh, originality and authorship, I think the environment, the economics uh, of AI, of sorry, of copyright around AI, um, also tend to prove that uh, copyright protection of outputs is not warranted. Um, and here I'd like to raise a few questions for the audience. So is there a market for AI generated content? And if so, would AI generated products truly compete with works produced by humans as substitute go goods? Uh, would the billions of AI generated outputs produced faster than any human could produce or consume need a copyright monopoly or of exploitation to avoid make market failure? Copyright protection, we argue, is not the appropriate mechanism to stimulate AI technology because um, there are other means that are more uh, suitable, uh, namely unfair competition, trade secrets, patent law, and to a certain degree, uh, copyright protection for software. Thank you very much, Brigitte. Uh, that was really interesting, and already some some questions that we can address in the uh, uh, in the discussion. I was not done with the presentation, but um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm happy to leave. Yeah, there was this was the first point. Um, yeah, so the, um, the outputs created by AI belong to the public domain because they shouldn't be protected by copyright. So we strongly urge against any temptation to create new sui generis rights to protect AI content. Uh, we believe that it should be in the public domain, pending a clear understanding of uh, this evolving technology. Next, please. Uh, we ran a survey uh, on Twitter a couple of months ago, and uh, our users indicated that they also believe that the outputs to almost, uh, well, more than two thirds believe that it should belong in the public domain. Next, please. So point two uh, is that we argue for broad exceptions and limitations for AI input. Uh, we think that broad and unfettered access and use of copyright works to train AI can help reduce bias, uh, enhance social inclusion and diversity, promote important public interest activities such as education and research and foster innovation in the development of AI. So assuming that access to the works is lawful at the point of input and that the purpose is legitimate in the public interest, uh, use of copyright works to train AI should be considered non-infringing by default. Um, I just want to note that this should not be confused with creating an access right. Next, please. As concerns uh, text and data mining, which is a subcategory of AI, we think that it's pivotal to support education, research, creativity, and data-driven innovation. Um, TDM activities are non-consumptive and non-expressive uses and may in fact increase demand for a wider range of works. Uh, therefore, TDM should not be restricted by copyright. It should not be considered copyright infringement, and it should not be made subject to additional authorizations or payments if access is lawful. So TDM should be supported pursuant to exceptions and limitations in the public interest. And the, the short form of this is that the right to read is the right to mine. Next, please. The third point uh, is concerning the broader approach that we uh, consider uh, issues outside of purely copyright concerns uh, and tackle ethical and privacy concerns. And this stems from the case arising in 2019 where um, IBM and other companies were trying, tra sorry, training their AI programs with openly licensed content with uh, notably uh, pictures that were found on Flickr and licensed openly through Creative Commons licenses. And, and they were training certain programs um, relating to facial recognition. And a lot of Flickr users found that their photos were being used for what they considered a concerning and prob problematic use uh, of their photographs. And so that raised the question uh, of whether the terms of the Creative Commons licenses uh, allowed this open content to be used as input to train AI without any further permission from the licensor. 
appreciate and really sorry do you can you wrap up a little bit yes this thank you me. we're running yeah. over time sure thank you last slide so let's skip this one So um, I think that if we want to have a more ethical approach to AI, the conversation has to include uh, other questions outside of copyright, but also consider ethics, responsibility, sustainability, cultural rights, human rights, personality rights, privacy rights, and data protection. And this will be my last slide, the next one. Uh, we uh, just released a new strategy at Creative Commons and the principles for an ethical commons underpin CC's new strategic direction. And I inserted a quote here uh, that is directly taken from our strategy that there are some ethic ethical concerns of problematic use of open content to train potentially harmful artificial intel intelligence technologies. And I will stop my presentation now and let other panelists um, share their insights and I look very much look forward to your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brigitte. That was really interesting. Um, I think it's going to be a, a good food for thought already for the panel discussion. So um, moving on, uh, next speaker is Javier Ruiz. Javier Ruiz is an independent mm -hmm. consultant covering a broad range of digital and technology policy and advocacy areas. Um, he's also a member of the UK government's expert advisory group on IP, and he was the former policy director of the Open Rights Group. So, uh, Javier, um, it's your turn. Thank you. Yes, so I guess I'm going to follow up uh, from what Brigitte was saying by looking at some of the... Um, trying to look at what we mean by openness in the context of artificial intelligence and what are some of the challenges that um, are presented at the moment. So I'm going to jump over quite a few things. You know, my presentation is not going to be such a co as coherent as the one for, for Brigitte, but hopefully it all makes sense. So next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So the... So the first question is that before we talk about AI, even um, we can take one step back to say, why, is, why are we talking about IP in a data protection conference? You know, and I think that, I mean, AI has brought to the to the fore, you know, uh, some issues that had been there, you know, in this uh, all along, in the sense that we need to understand the technologies that underpin uh, where data is held, if we want to to protect it. And we are looking at things like, for example, if we say that. Uh, is some data um, identifiable? Has it been anonymized? You know, if we sometimes we need to actually understand what is the state of the art and what has been applied to that um, to that data. Of course, the right of explanation, which is very close to all the discussions with AI, can you know is limited by commercial confidentiality, and that means intellectual property in many cases. And also, if we want to understand what are security measures, such as encryption, you know, we also want to understand, you know, what technology is there behind. So, before we get to AI, you know, this discussion is still quite relevant to many other areas, you know, of technical accountability of data protection. Slide, please. So now the question is that something that I'm following up again, you know, we say, well, we want the outputs of AI and we want to have openness, you know, on the inputs and the outputs. But something that is quite interesting is actually that we don't really, there is very little agreement on what are we talking about when we talk about AI. So, I mean, if we say that, you know, something, if a program has recognized you as your face, what does that mean? And in many cases, what we are looking at is simple tables of a statistical uh, probabilities that are then transformed into insights, you know, as a result of um, some sort of um, analysis. And um, in some cases, that analysis may even depend on the sensitivity, you know, for example, you know, if um, the recognition of faces depends on the sensitivity of the model, do we think that some 60% probability is a match or it's not a match? So the idea of the output of AI gets really, really complicated. And that's something that um, is quite hard to understand if we want to know what, what it should be open. I think copyright is one area, of course, you know, but there are many other issues in, in the middle. For example, there is the the focus on data is quite important. And I think that a lot of the, that is one of the key differences between AI and traditional software, the role that computers are supposed to learn from the data rather than being told what to, you know, 
in a linear form what the results should be. But still, you know, I mean, there is, the code is still important and the code is broken down, you know, known. there are libraries that are open source. There are APIs that you can use, you know, from Google or Facebook. And it's quite to be able to have accountability and be able to tell whether um, a decision is fair, for example, you need to understand and unpack quite a few things in the process. And that goes again, you know, about what we, people call the models, you know, where things like the training processes, you know, like the labeling, the quality of the labeling of databases, you know, and even the hardware that you use, you know, and access to the hardware can um, can have an effect. So I think that, you know, one of the things that I think is important is to start really problematizing, you know, what we mean by, you know, AI in a technical perspective. And I mean, the thing is, uh, in most cases, you know, the focus has moved to the data. And in that um, in that sense, you know, the, the data is really, really important, but it's definitely not the only thing. And I think that we, you wanna get the next slide? Oh, sorry, there's a bit of a gap. I mean, just to, you know, we don't have um, slides of, um, of examples, but just to give an idea, I mean, we all know that, you know, there are many, many things that are, um, that are um, developed with computers in other areas. For example, you know, there are in the whole of the pharmaceutical industry, I mean, many medicines are literally churned out by computers, you know, almost randomly testing all sorts of variations of molecules and trying to generate um, patented um, medicines out of it. So I think that the challenges of um, AI or automated uh, creativity are going to go beyond copyright and that they are going to be, and they're still, uh, they're still quite problematic. I mean, one famous example of a patent uh, that came out of AI is actually the Oral-B toothbrush. One of the heads for Oral-B uh, was created by a computer, you know, basically randomly trying all sorts of, um, all sorts of uh, combinations, you know, of, um, and uh, eventually it, uh, it was, it was patented. So um, next slide. Mm -hmm. So now the question here is again, you know, that going back to data. So even if we, if there is more than data in the whole equation for AI and accountability, data is central and it's key. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, I think the role is sometimes a bit exaggerated. There is this idea of data being the new oil as if it was like really the only thing that matter. And you have uh, now this whole idea of data sovereignty in countries like India, you know, where they said that the data should not leave the country and it should be treated as a national asset, you know, like uh, as if it was a natural resource that belongs to the Indian state, you know, to, to control the exploitation. I think that is a bit naive if you look at all the wider technical infrastructure, but still it shows that data is really important. And if you talk to people from companies like uh, Google or DeepMind, what they say is that they want to protect their investment. And they understand that, yeah, there is the whole thing with AI can be complicated and the problem we have there is that we just don't understand what a fair exchange of value for the data uh, means you know what would be so okay if you want to invest into something you know and you think that you should get some profit out of it that's fine but if you're using my data or public data we still don't understand and i think that when you talk about personal data you know like the any discussion of talking about economic uh, compensation you know very quickly pushes the discussion away from fundamental rights but the but this idea of value means that at the moment you are getting systems that are completely closed. Now, there is there are several demands um, for data in policies. I mean, I think in Europe, um, there is now, as we know, the Digital Service Act and the Digital Markets Act. Uh, there are the demands for access to data are fairly limited. You know, I think that, you know, there is going to be there's a proposal for access to data just for vetted researchers and for very limited purposes. So it's not that, you know, uh, digital companies will have to open up their systems to full accountability and explanation, you know, but there is a, there is an, an <clears throat> there is at least some starting point on that. And then the Digital Markets Act uh, will propose some enhanced data portability, um, not uh, in real time following GDPR, uh, but again, you know, which could be useful. And then it also, um, it also um, proposes to have access to that companies have to give the European Commission access to databases and, and algorithms, um, you know, to be able to request explanations. And actually the fines for refusing to have access are fairly high. Although if we look at the enforcement of GDPR, you can see that we can wait a few years before we see a 5% turnover fine. Okay, sorry, next. Mm -hmm. Next. 
Mm -hmm. So there are these demands, but at the same time that we have uh, this uh, movement towards accountability of technical systems, and I mean the, the very reason that we are having this panel in the first place, we also see uh, elsewhere uh, certain um, initiatives to try to restrict access to data, and that is particularly in free trade agreements, which is an area that I've been following quite closely in the past few years. You know. And the, I mean, digital trade agreements, um, in, the, in the first place, they clash with data protection by mandating free flow of data and um, with a limited exception regime. Although they accept that there should be some data protection in place, you know, there, in many cases, you know, they, they bring a race to the bottom in standards, you know. And then, um, but these are not the only measures, you know, I mean, there's a lot of discussion around data protection and trade at the moment, you know, but if you go to the next slide. <laughs> We see that actually there are restrictions also to protect um, what I call companies' intangible assets. You know, I don't want to call them intellectual property because many of these things are not strictly intellectual property, and in many cases they shouldn't be property. But basically, there are trade agreements say that governments uh, should not make access to markets conditional on disclosure of source code, algorithms, or encryption technology, and these are of course all issues that will impinge on the accountability of AI and demands to access the, um, these systems. I mean, there are problems in the sense that also that the, um, these demands sit on top of um, intellectual property. So all the stuff that um, Brigitte was discussing before about copyright, you know, I mean, this thing would completely ride over any exceptions or limitations that you have on copyright. You will have a completely parallel system for exceptions based on trade law, which are a lot harder for individuals to to enforce and of course you know that there is no i mean there are some exceptions for regulate for regulators to have access you know but there are very limited exceptions for uh, proactive policies to demand that for example you know the outputs of ai or the algorithms or things like that you know are accessible on a routine basis so these are um, these are areas that are becoming quite problematic, you know, and would have um, potentially quite a large impact on the discussions we are having. I think that's uh, yeah, next slide. That's mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so yeah, just to wrap up. So yeah, as I said before, you know, there are the main points. I think are that a to understand um, the relationship between intellectual property and uh, privacy, you know, we need to go beyond AI and look at many other areas. We need to understand what we mean by artificial intelligence in a lot more detail to understand what kind of intellectual property applies and specifically around data, which I think is the focus of the following presentations, you know, that, are, that is, uh, it is very important, but it's definitely not the only thing. And uh, we have to be careful that all the policy proposals and all the, you know, uh, positive measures that we may take to give access to data for accountability are not undermined by parallel um, agreements made in the space of international trade. Thank you. Thank you very much, Javier. Um, our next speaker is Professor Maurizio Boghi, um, who is a professor of law and the director of the Center for Intellectual Property Policy and Management at Bournemouth University. Uh, prior to joining Bournemouth, he has been a lecturer at Brunel University Law School and a research fellow at the Bocconi University in Milan. And Professor Borghi is working extensively on copyright, so um, his presentation will give us the solution we have all been eagerly waiting for. So please, Maurizio, if you uh, are ready. And it seems that you are muted. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Freya. Not a problem. I will focus on copyright in my presentation. And uh, copyright is both part of the problem, but also, I think, also part of the solution of the problem. In the same way as Creative Commons, as we know, is a, is a private mechanism, is a licensing mechanism at the end that is based on copyright so as creatively used copyright as a part of the solution that copyright um, creates next slide please <clears throat> so
So uh, we, we don't need to to discuss definitions of artificial intelligence. I'm just uh, um, using this, uh, this sentence. Among the many definitions that I found, I think this one is probably the, the, the one I like more because at the end of the day, it, it is a matter of using computers to perform human tasks better than humans. So the only thing is what does better mean? Uh, it, may, it might be simply faster or more accurately, so it might involve a qualitative element, or simply cheaply. I mean, computers do not uh, need uh, uh, sick, do not need, need uh, holidays, leave, uh, sickness leave. They don't strike. They are much cheaper than than humans in performing tasks, and this is probably um, one of the main reasons of the success of, of artificial intelligence in today's business models. Next, please. Uh, so there are certain myths and, and, and realities surrounding uh, AI. AI system can be objective and emotional, facts-based. They must inform decision in a more uh, fact-based way. They increase transparency in human decisions. They now um, create uh, uh, more opportunities for, for creativity. In uh, Brigitte presentation, we have seen an example of this. Uh, however, I, will, I want to focus here on a particular reality of AI today. The fact that uh, due to uh, tech giants dominance, AI actually leads to an increase in concentration of power and lack of democratic control. And I think here is where the issue of openness, of open AI uh, becomes relevant, becomes important at society level. Next, please. So I will focus on the input data. Okay, so Brigitte has expanded on, uh, on the output. Um, I will focus primarily on the input. So openness, means to an extent uh, to be able to access data to feed machine learning to feed algorithms the more access the more data you can access the better data you can access uh, the better the uh, algorithm works and there are legal limitations uh, first one the most relevant one is is the GDPR. Uh, there are other legal limitations. Javier was mentioning confidentiality is a big issue with uh, access of data. There are other non-IP um, limitations, contract, and so on. I will focus on copyright and related rights. Next, please. <coughs> So, um, in, in Brigitte's presentation, um, there was a mention of uh, advocating for broad uh, copyright exceptions, okay? Expanding copyright exceptions uh, means at least the prima facie to uh, expand access to uh, data protected by copyright. So, let's say works. And uh, fair use, the U.S as fair use as, uh, uh, is frequently mentioned as a, um, as a model, okay? It has many advantages. It's flexible. It can be adapted to new technologies without uh, new legal intervention. So historically, it's a judicially created defense that now is codified in the U.S. Copyright Act in Section 107 which, uh, as I said, is flexible because it includes an exemplary list of permissible uses, um, coupled with a four-factor analysis, which courts apply on a case-by-case -case basis. And if we look at recent jurisprudence, fair use has been extensively applied not only to uh, non-codified creative users, uses. For example, parody. Parody is not mentioned in Section 107, but the the, the U.S. Supreme Court has applied by analogy fair use to a part 
or the, and so on, but also to technological uses. And these are the uses that are directly relevant to uh, artificial intelligence. Thumbnails, linking, digitization. Yes, next please. What is the problem with, uh, with, uh, with fair use? I mean, fair use is a fantastic legal tool. Um, everyone likes it. Uh, it means uh, flexibility, more openness. However, there is a problem. The problem is that there are no conditions attached to permissible uses. It means that it is black or white. Either a use is permitted or is prohibited. And if it is permitted, then the fair user can create exclusive entitlements over copyright exempted uses. This is what I call fair use exclusivity. And I think this is more clear if we uh, take uh, uh, an example. Next, please. <clears throat> the first example is Google Books. Okay, we all use uh, Google Books, it's a fantastic instrument. We can uh, search into millions of books. We can download uh, public domain books uh, for free. However, and this is possible because of fair use, because um, um, US courts found that these activities scanning books and making them searchable online is fair use under US law. Uh, however, Google has a monopoly as an exclusive entitlement to use all those millions digitized books for AI, for text mining, for uh, machine learning. Um, so it's good for us, it's good for me, for you, to access books, but it's not good for Google's competitors. Uh, I don't see the slides anymore. Anyway, um, another example, that, uh, this is not just because Google is, um, is a big company and... Uh, um, with the slide. And uh, is in a, is is in a dominant position. Uh, this also happens in other cases, and another case is uh, is uh, is Turnitin. Okay, as as you if you are a university lecturer, you know that Turnitin is, is widely used as a software to detect the plagiarism in students' essays. Okay, again, this is a use that has been found to be fair use under US law. Um, the thing is that Turnitin has access to all billion of students' papers that have been submitted over the years uh, and has de facto a monopoly over a wealthy uh, set of data that uh, has an incredible value for machine learning and for, for uh, uh, text and data mining and is not sharing this with anyone, of course, because this is their asset. And this is, this is a, a, a side effect of fair use, is, is a, um, I would say, the dark side of fair use. Okay, so... Um, Moving now to Europe, what is the European um, the European approach to uh, access uh, to copyright content for uh, artificial intelligence purposes? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yes. Well, I don't see the slides, but no. Apparently, I mean, the can... technical liaisons liaisons network is down. So let's hope that people. Okay. Okay. No problem. I, uh, I, I, I will. I will finish my my presentation uh, with with no slides. So imagine to to have in front of you a slide with the with the new uh, copyright directive and uh, uh, Article three and four. Okay. Articles three and four of the new copyright directive introduce a new exception for text and data mining. Okay. Brigitte was mentioning this previously in, in her presentation. 
So essentially, the European approach is to have uh, codified exceptions. And now we have an exception for text and data mining, which, which is directly relevant for, uh, for AI. Uh, in essence, uh, this except, there is a, a, an exception for non-commercial scientific text and data mining. Uh, and an exception for commercial text and data mining, which is subject to a reserve, meaning that rights holders can reserve uh, the right. I read uh, um, Article 4.3 because it's important for the point I want to make now. The exception or limitation provided for in paragraph one, so the exception for text and data mining, shall apply on condition that the use of words and other subject matter referred to in that paragraph has not been expressly reserved by the right holders in an appropriate manner, such as machine readable means in the case of content made publicly available online. So um, um, a right holder, it can be an author, it can be a publisher, um, can sort of opt out from, from the exception by imposing a, re a reserve. So this is quite unusual in copyright. You don't have many examples of this um, um, in copyright. And this is, uh, historically, this is because of, of, uh, of lobbying from, from, from publishers, okay? They wanted to introduce this, this provision. However, this provision has also another important possible application because it creates de facto property rights on text and data mining. Okay. And if you think of what I said at the beginning with respect to Creative Commons, Creative Commons is a license that builds on property rights. So in the same way, the, the Creative Commons principle could be applied to text and data mining in the sense that if I am an author, uh, I can reserve the right and release the content uh, with a general public license with viral effect, okay, with a share alike provision. And once I am in, the, in, in uh, control of the content, I can be a, an author, I can be a publisher, so I can control a single work, I can control a database of works. I can also impose conditions on the use. And these conditions could be, for example, I allow everyone to use my database for text and data mining on condition that um, your algorithm is transparent on condition that the output of your um, text and data mining um, is distributed under the same license conditions, um, or that you allow that, that your algorithm is not biased, is transparent, and so on. Mauricio, are you possible to wrap it up a little bit? Yes, Perfect. this concludes. Uh, my 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 presentation. I think the um, the main point is that the concept of openness need rethinking in the um, uh, in the context of uh, artificial intelligence and the Creative Commons approach, which has been very successful for uh, copyright works, uh, can be successfully applied for opening access to AI content. Thank you very much, Maurizio. That's really, uh, uh, really interesting. And I'm sure that we'll be able to discuss this a little bit more in the uh, in the panel discussion later. Um, moving on really quickly again to leave some time. Uh, next speaker is Mikhail Czerniowski, who was a last minute uh, addition. I'm really happy that he was able to, uh, to join us. Um, he works as a legal officer at the EDPB. Um, and he has been directly involved in the process of drafting and negotiating the GDPR, the e-privacy regulation, and the recast of the PSI directive. 
So please, uh, Mikal, if you want to take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fria. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, the previous speakers made uh, my job easier. Bridget mentioned uh, ethical concern, Javier, uh, anonymization and transparency, but also the uh, digital agenda of the EU, so Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act. Uh, Mauricio uh, mentioned the risk of lack of control and, and he uh, also made my favorite acronym, um, the GDPR. Uh, I will approach, uh, I will try to approach uh, uh, openness from a little bit different angle, from poorly personal data uh, protection uh, angle. Um, opening of uh, public sector information and, and data in uh, uh, general, because uh, the ultimate goal is to open not also PSI, but also data stored by businesses. This is not a one-time activity, but it's a process uh, scheduled for, for many years. This is not a kind of revolution. I would call opening of uh, data is uh, a kind of uh, evolution. Uh, it, in 2019, the recast of the PSI directive took uh, place. Now the work on the Data Governance Act uh, has uh, started on, on the legislation that is aimed at fostering uh, sharing of data by, by businesses. And we may still uh, see uh, this year the review of database directive, so-called Data Act. So, so there are many legislative uh, initiatives in, uh, in this uh, area. When talking, uh, when, when opening data, when talking about openness, uh, I think it is important to create future-proof uh, uh, solutions. We don't know what uh, future algorithm or future AI will be cap capable of. We don't know yet. Uh, we may guess, but we don't know yet uh, what will be uh, what data will be of high value uh, in the future. But we can already uh, set uh, certain principles. Uh, and from the perspective of uh, European Data Protection Board, from the uh, perspective of the uh, data uh, protection body, uh, it's uh, obvious that uh, any legislation, any laws that deal with reuse, with openness, should apply without prejudice to, to data protection laws. Uh, and we think that uh, protecting uh, personal data and opening data uh, can go uh, hand uh, in hand. And um, uh, from um, here, you have to also imagine a, a short presentation. And from the data prote protection perspective, the main um, questions that uh, arise is how to make opening and openness of data lo lawful, how to ensure transparency of opening of data, and how to ensure uh, um, proportionality. So to answer a question, what is actually ne actually needed for uh, reuse and uh, how to um, ensure that data are used, are being processed for the, uh, the purpose uh, that was uh, agreed. Many years ago, the predecessor of the uh, European Data Protection Board, uh, Article 29 Working Party issued an, an opinion of uh, PSI reuse. This is opinion number six. And, uh, 13 and already there it um, introduced a concept of uh, uh, data protection uh, impact assessment as a way forward when opening uh, data. So uh, DPIA uh, allows to assess the legal basis for a possible disclosure of data. Uh, it allows to uh, determine the, the safeguards that should be uh, applied and uh, it also allows to uh, assess uh, purpose limitation, proportionality, uh, data uh, minimization and uh, consider if there are any uh, special measures, if there is a special uh, protection required uh, when, when dealing with uh, uh, sensitive, so-called sensitive uh, data. Another uh, way forward may be uh, anonymization or aggregation providing statistical data. 
So uh, before opening a data, the question can be asked, uh, do we uh, really need to uh, reuse or, or open data that may be considered uh, personal uh, data? Uh, as regards uh, the risk, uh, risks from the data protection perspective related to the uh, opening of data, there is this risk of uh, loss of transparency and purpose limitation. So basically the loss, uh, this is something uh, Mauricio mentioned, the, 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 the uh, loss of control of what is happening with the data that are subject to reuse. And uh, from uh, another concern, another possible concern is the risk of re-identification. So we may have the data that are anonymized. Uh, we may have the data that are being considered, uh, for example, statistical data, but for example, uh, combined with uh, other data sets, uh, uh, they become again personal data and they allow to uh, identify uh, a person uh, to, which, to, to which they are related. So this, this could uh, violate uh, fundamental, this, this, this could have implications for, from fundamental uh, and uh, privacy uh, perspective. Um, when we talk about um, AI, uh, I, uh, with like the, the, the sharing of data for AI, this is something uh, you said at the very beginning may involve and usually involve uh, large scale processing. So uh, we are combining data from uh, various sources. Uh, we, we may process uh, so-called uh, sensitive data and uh, or we may process uh, data of uh, vulnerable groups uh, of uh, people i don't know the date for example data of of children in uh, so when processing a data uh, by by ai in particular large scale pro processing um, uh, basically there is an obligation already now under article 35 of the gdpr to um, conduct a data protection impact assessment uh, what we encourage is to making the results of such assessment uh, public. Uh, this this contributes to trust uh, and, and and transparency of, of the uh, processing. We uh, also think that uh, whenever opening data that may be considered per personal data, um, information should be provided to the data subject that they, the data may be subject to um, uh, reuse. I think uh, I don't have much time uh, more, so maybe I will uh, uh, just pass some 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 um, uh, uh, like some some key message, like the, the points I, I consider the most uh, uh, important. So, uh, as I said at the very beginning, opening openness of data. This is a, a not a revolution. This is an evolution. This is something uh, we should uh, monitor closely and just uh, being here, I see that this is a process that is um, closely followed by the, by the number of uh, uh, scholars and, and, and experts from different fields. But no matter how uh, we define openness of data, uh, it needs to be ba based on uh, trust. So uh, see, we believe that citizens will not embrace data innovation um, uh, that is not uh, uh, trustworthy. And what, one of the ways of the ensuring trust is following the uh, strict European data protection rules. Uh, another uh, pillar is transparency, ensuring transparency and, and fairness. So um, to inform people what may happen to their data if they are subject to uh, reuse. And uh, with respect to fairness, to process data only in the way that could be uh, reasonably expected uh, by, by uh, people uh, concerned. And finally, uh, conducting in particular when, when opening data for AI, conducting data protection impact um, assessment uh, uh, under, yeah, under Article 35 GDPR. I think th this would be the first time, uh, the first step to ensure that uh, we have in place some kind of future-proof uh, uh, solutions. As I said, we don't really know yet uh, 
what uh, future algorithms will be uh, capable of, and uh, we don't know yet what data will be in the future of high value, although I'm sure that these data are being uh, already collected uh, by specialized companies and, uh, and by different uh, stakeholders. So uh, that's all from my side. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mikal. Um, so I'm looking at the chat right now to see if there are any questions uh, for the speakers that have come up. Um, everyone uh, who's uh, listening, please do uh, uh, do submit your questions. Uh, we will be here discussing them uh, for a little bit longer. Um, so I have a question. Um, I think this is uh, directed to um, uh, to Brigitte. Um, if the output of AI is considered original under copyright law, then patent law is also not applicable. Um, is there? Is um, I think that's also a question that uh, Louis already addressed, right? Uh, the scope of uh, patent protection for AI uh, outcomes. But perhaps you want to uh, say something a little bit more uh, on that. So at Creative Commons, we haven't looked at patent protection at all. Um, the only thing I can say is that we have to be careful about overprotection. Um, so we are against any form of protection of AI output. Um, we do think that the uh, innovation and investment in AI should be compensated, but copyright is not the appropriate mechanism for it. And I think that we have to be careful that these outputs are not uh, further enclosed uh, and that uh, there shouldn't be any form of protection, whether uh, copyright or sweet generis. But as I said, we haven't looked at the patent protection angle. Okay. Okay, thank you. I hope that, that uh, answered the question. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Um, Alina Wernick uh, asked if uh, we could recommend any papers on trade agreements um, and IP protection and AI. I think that that one is directed at, um, uh, at Cathy. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can recommend the paper specifically. Uh, it was published a couple of days ago. Uh, it's by Christina Irion, uh, who's at the University of Amsterdam. And she specifically wrote a paper, uh, a report commissioned by the German Consumer uh, Union um, on this topic. I don't have the URL, but if you Google uh, Christina Irion, I R I. O N uh, trade and AI, and uh, you will find it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Of course, instead of Google, you can use any other preferable. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. quant. <laughs> if you quant it, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, let's see if there's anything else. Um, no, I don't see any more questions uh, coming in. Um, I do have a question myself, if I may, which I think is um, uh, allowed. Uh, as being the moderator. Um, so how does the panel see um, uh, the um, uh, data minimization and the need for AI to ha perhaps have more data to avoid some of the risks that we have been talking about? So the risk for bias, the risk for um, uh, adverse effects. Um, how, how do you do these two um, contradict or can they even um, uh, help improve um, what AI can do in terms of beneficial uh, innovations? Uh, perhaps, Mikal, you want to uh, say um, something on that? Yes, uh, sure. I, I think uh, it, it applies to any processing operation and this is one of the principles um, uh, from, uh, from the GDPR, from Article 5 GDPR that uh, uh, data uh, should be processed for specific purposes and before um, opening uh, data, before, uh, you know, uh, using AI, uh, we have to uh, ask ourselves what type of data do we need and uh, whether we really need to crawl all these uh, data that are available. And, and usually, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 in, in many situations, there will be just some, uh, for example, some categories of data uh, we are interested in, uh, and we like th this is some this is this is something 
um, that is already uh, foreseen in the GDPR. Uh, and uh, I, as I said, uh, every, any provisions on reuse should apply without prejudice to the um, to the data protection uh, laws. So I just hope that the, uh, that that this will be that this, this principle will be will be uh, uh, followed. I assume that at some point we'll have some AI regulation, probably starting with ethics. And I assume this will be one of the topics discussed uh, there, the ne necessity that do we really need to open certain categories of data for, for AI? Thank you, uh, Mikal. Is there somebody else who perhaps wants to uh, address this question? No. Well, it seemed... oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, we seem to have something. Okay, we have five minutes left. How did it feel? I think one of the difficulties is to define what the the purpose of the data data processing is, mm -hmm. and because the uh, the um, the use of data might be correct in terms of minimization, proportionality, etc. But then the question is whether the purpose of this processing is uh, ethic, is uh, because there are certain certain uh, purposes of, of AI that uh, uh, that that are are questionable. So we, we for example, there has been a, a discussion on facial recognition, on uh, software that uh, of deep uh, fake uh, um, AI. Um, all these uses, we know. I mean, technology has always both good and and bad uses. But there are certain technologies that are primarily used for dubious uh, purposes. So, um, so it's good to to ask the question of what is the whether data are what data has been used. If the, the use of data is. Uh, um, is allowed under the GDPR standard, but also a question, a bigger, a bigger question is what the purpose of the AI mm -hmm. is. Yeah. And that then, I guess, relates back to the question of openness. How open, uh, yeah, how do we define the openness? Openness for what? Openness for whom? Um, sorry, Kathy mm -hmm. uh, and then Brigitte? No, no, it's okay. Let's, you know, Brigitte. I was just going to add that the, the, the criterion that we've uh, started to, to think about in determining the, the purpose is the, is the public interest. So if the purpose is in the public interest, uh, that could be a good guidance to uh, either allow or uh, restrict uh, the use of the uh, openly licensed content or, or any creative content uh, as an input mm -hmm. for AI. Yeah. And then do you agree that we also need perhaps more transparency and more openness about the way the AI functions itself as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, thank you uh, very much uh, to the panelists. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in. Uh, famous final last words from anyone what we need to consider when we are uh, addressing these topics. And I'm sure that we will be talking about this for a uh, few more years to come, um, especially, of course, in the context of the, uh, the new proposals that um, uh, the European Commission has just published regarding uh, the regulation of data spaces, uh, the Data Service Act, uh, the regulation of digital platforms. Um, mm -hmm. Can I invite? I yeah, I mean, I can say, I think for me, one, one consideration, I think, with many of these proposals is to to be careful, I mean, if we say that we are creating certain obligations on, for example, gatekeepers, and we say, you know, these are, to what point are we creating a transformative process that will mean that these people are no longer going to be gatekeepers, or how much are we accepting and crystallizing that position, and now you're actually making, giving them like a, a legal title, no? you are now the gatekeepers, you know, it's almost like you are, before they were the gatekeepers, now officially, and you, EU law, you can become a gatekeeper. So I think that something, I mean, in many things, um, in many situations, without entering in details, we have to be careful that regulation doesn't simply patch up the, um, you know, 
the worst aspects of a situation and makes it more permanent. And I think for me, some of the proposals around access and you know what we are trying to do to regulate platforms and to bring accountability, the danger is that we create a few uh, little small solutions, but ultimately we are not creating a fundamental transformation. So we are just consolidating, you know, what the status quo is. Yeah. Does anybody else want to jump in? Well, if I may, just to say that openness per se is not is not sufficient. Is not enough. Um, openness is a, is a good thing, but in the in the context of artificial intelligence, it might go hand in hand with the stronger monopolies, with stronger uh, concentration of power. So I think the the challenge is to enable uh, people to take back control of their data, take back control of their creative works. And I think that the, the way Creative Commons has creatively used property rights in a non-proprietary way uh, is, uh, is uh, something that needs to be creatively applied in other areas of, um, of data. I'd like to echo what Mauricio just said by adding um, just some final words, but that as any um, fundamental ideal, um, openness, I think, has, can bring a lot of positive uh, effects on the development of AI. Uh, but uh, this openness of data is not an absolute and it has to be balanced with uh, considerations for privacy, ethics uh, and other uh, legal or, um, or other requirements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was me to uh, close up the panel and to uh, thank all of the panelists, uh, Javier, uh, Mikael, Brigitte and Maurizio. Um, everybody who has joined the session, thank you also very much. Um, it's a shame that I can't see anybody or uh, um, yeah, interact with you. Um, still, um, I hope you had a good session. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And if there are any questions, don't hesitate to contact uh, any one of us. We'll be happy to uh, uh, to continue the mm -hmm. discussion uh, afterwards. So thank you very much. Thanks, Freya. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.